Good evening, everyone. It is 7 o'clock, and we will call the meeting to order. Can I have an acceptance of the agenda? So moved. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. We'll move on to the second part of number one, which is the walk-in period. Are there any walk-ins here? Ms. Burbine. Ann Burbine, 10 Pentecost Road, Chairman of the South Shore Coalition. We met last Thursday night with uh, Mass DOT, and this is what the new bridge will look like. And I will leave these pictures with you. Um, they plan to start construction at the end of this, by the end of this year. Um, it will be, it's supposed to be finished by October of 2016. Things have been written into the contract that for every day that they're late, they get fined. For every day that they're early, they get a bonus. The engineers asked I mean, when they came before the RFP, they have a request for, you know, whatever it is that you call it. Well, can we change, you know, can we add, can we subtract? And Michael O'Dowd said, you can <coughs> do whatever you want, but the bridge has to look exactly like this. And that's the way it's going to be. There will be an outreach person. The only problem will be in the last six months when they're down to one lane in each direction. And Mass DOT, that segment of it, is pushing for use the boats use the buses, use the train, and you all know what has happened in the last few weeks. And just as a reminder, there is a meeting at Hingham, public meeting on, I believe it's the 8th of February from 6 <coughs> to 8, South Shore Coalition will be writing a letter because we have been in support of um, mixed use development, public <coughs> transportation, and there's a piece on um, WHGH Channel 5 tonight about the Hingham Shipyard and that it may go bankrupt if something happens with transportation that this was all built around. So thank you for your time, gentlemen. Great. And can you just give us that date again, that, that date that it's supposed to be done by? October 2016. 2016. Okay. Okay, four years hence. Great. So thank you. Message. Thanks for leaving. This is cool. Thanks. Are there any other walk-ins this evening? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to item number three, which is a discussion vote on a one-day liquor license for the Harbor Community Building. Is Mr. Gary here? <clears throat> How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks. If you can just say your name and address to start us off. Uh, sure. My name is Michael Geary, and uh, I'd like to rent the Harbor Community Building um, this Sunday uh, to hold. Uh, party after my son's baptism. It's going to be catered by the silent chef and the liquor liability license would be through, through them. I spoke to Kim Donovan and she said that would be acceptable. Great. What The hours are two to six? Yes. Any live music or any? No. Nope. Just a reception with uh, food, food and beverages. Yep. Great. Any uh, comments? Tricia, is that fine in terms of liability? The liquor yeah, license of the silent chef? To, yeah, we just have to close the loop with the silent chef that their name in the town is an additional insured, and we'll be fine. I have that. Yep, so you that's fine. That. Yep. Great. Motion? Please. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to grant a one day wine and malt beverage license to Michael Geary, 19 Lydia Lane, for a private function to be held on Sunday, January 29th, 2012, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the Situate Harbor Community Building located at 44 Jericho Road. Second. Second by Mr. Harris for the discussion. Yeah, one point. Yes. Congratulations on oh, the baptism. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. <clears throat> Have a great day. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, moving on to not item number four, which is just a discussion for the Veterans <coughs> Advisory Board. Mr. Kelly. Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Good evening. How are you? Thanks for seeing us. Uh, Joe and Karen Kelly, 16 Town Way. Uh, and uh, let me get started. This is Jim Hunt. James Hunt, 66 Manuel Road. Hi, Jim. How are you? I trust you um, uh, have uh, had the opportunity to look over some of the uh, pieces that I left with Kim. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
As you know, Karen and I are both gold star parents of fallen hero Sergeant Michael J. Kelly. The reason why I'm speaking to you this evening is that I recently discovered that our town ranks dead last in per capita veteran benefit distribution to our veterans in need. <clears throat> our son Michael was killed in action defending our nation, state, and community's freedoms. Michael did indeed pay the ultimate price. We as a family choose to continue Michael's quest to preserve our freedoms. I as a Gold Star dad can no longer allow our town to rank dead last. Uh, this is not our way that we wish to honor our son's memory. Uh, if I can quote President Calvin Coolidge, once said, the nation which forgets its defenders will itself be forgotten. I'm sure that applies to communities also. <clears throat> Karen and I want to help elevate Situate to a respectable level of service to our veterans and then and only then we as a community can look a soldier in the eye and say I'm from Situate and I would like to thank you for your service. It is our goal that working with the Board of Selectmen and soon to and soon the newly formed Veterans Board we can ensure that Situate's veterans are afforded every benefit due them in recognition of their service. It is with that goal in mind that I present up the proposal for the immediate formation of a Situate Veterans Advisory Board of which I'm willing to take the leadership responsibility. Um, we can no longer stand by, and I want to I want to read an article that I came across real quick. I can find it. Uh, well, it was a recent, that's okay, it was a recent article uh, in the, in the uh, newspaper, <clears throat> and it talked about the issues that veterans are having uh, coming back from uh, these deployments. And, and basically what we're <coughs> looking at is we're looking at veterans that volunteer or have volunteered over the last 10 years. These guys are National Guardsmen and Reservists. There is a rise in... Uh, problems at home uh, with, with uh, chi child uh, uh, beatings and things like that. We're, we're concerned about that. Uh, and without, you know, some support here in town, uh, I, I think it's going to get, uh, you know, carried away somewhat. So, uh, again, in, in, as envisioned in the attached proposal, and I'm going to kind of go over the proposal a little bit, uh, the Situate Veterans Advisory Board would not conflict with the mandatory uh, District Veterans Services Board required under the provisions of the law, whereas the required district board would function in an operational role, including the VSO and assistant appointments, compensation, distribution of benefits, and state reimbursements. The advisory board being proposed would merely, merely advisory and informational in nature, seeking only to facilitate open and honest communication between local parties. <clears throat> and uh, you should have a, a copy of that, the, the articles. And uh, again, I'm just going to go over the purposes of, of the advisory board. Uh, to provide support to all Situate veterans. To provide support to Situate Veterans Services Officer. Uh, to serve as a liaison between Situate veterans and the Situate Board of Selectmen. To serve as an advisor between Situate veterans and all other town of Situate departments and committees to serve as a liaison between Situate veterans and Situate residents, to promote the recognition and observance of patriotic holidays and events to include but not limited to Veterans Day, Memorial Day, Flag Day, Fourth of July, National POW MIA recognition, and the observance of wreaths across America, to foster an understanding and appreciation within the town of Situate of the achievements, contributions, and sacrifices veterans have made to the town in our nation. To promote outreach programs to all situate residents, of, excuse me, to all situate veterans, the purpose would be to inform veterans of their benefits under the law. <clears throat> Again, uh, I was just made aware of the, of the, of the problems here in situate uh, and the lack of services uh, to the veterans here in Situate. And um, again, my, my son lies at Cudworth Cemetery down the street. 
And for us to, uh, you know, uh, allow this to continue is certainly not, a, not the way to honor a fallen hero from Situate uh, and, and all the other veterans that follow him. Uh, so it is, it is our desire that uh, we immediately consider uh, a activating this uh, advisory board. I'm, like I said before, I'm willing to take on the responsibility of that. You're in the process of hire, hiring a part-time veteran service agent. We are willing to help that service agent in his ramp up uh, to learn his duties. Uh, I have the full, being a Gold Star father, I have the full support of Secretary Coleman Nee and uh, his board. Matter of fact, I had a meeting with him three weeks ago, and we have, to my knowledge right now, we have six veterans that need services, and he's willing to send down one of his assistants to help in the paperwork for those six veterans in town. He's willing to help. So these are the kinds of things that we can do uh, to advance Situate. I mean, it's a shame. I mean, we, I, when, I, when I saw the reports produced by Coleman Nee of, of where Situate lay, lies in comparison to other South Shore towns, it's, it's a sh damn shame. It's pitiful that we well, should allow that to continue. Yeah. Mr. Kelly, let me, I know I speak for the board to say that we completely support this 100 percent, and that's what the initiatives have been over the last several months, is to move in that direction. I think that, I think that the um, numbers that you're referring to that rank us last is, is just in, 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 uh, due to the few amount of payouts and the, and the low amount of people that have actually seek the services from the town, not in terms of the town turning people away. So, I'm not saying that. Yeah, so I, no, I just want to make it clear, and that's what we've noticed that too, as Trisha's looked into it and seen our numbers compared to other communities' numbers, how we are much lower than other communities, and that's why we're taking these initiatives to, you know, improve our veteran agent services, get a part time person, get the advisory. We talked about it a month ago to get this committee together and start getting. Uh, more reach out to the community to right. find out who actually needs the services because right. by no means is the town not wanting to provide the services right. or we it's not even that we don't have the funds to do it it's just people have not be, been coming to us in uh, maybe they don't know what they can get or um, not aware or they don't know the channels to go get it and that's that's what the whole initiative that we're working on right now is is to get people whatever they deserve and whatever they need well the, the other concern I have is we know for a fact there's 1600 veterans here in Situate what we don't know is how many widows of those veterans fallen veterans mm. there's no count for those mm. okay and we'd like to be able to reach out to those folks too right. and that's I think that's all part of the initiative that that we're working on now I, I don't know if um, Mr. Norton I just have a, a couple of comments, really, and I uh, follow up what Tony said. You know, this, since Conley brought this up probably a month or two ago, we've been working in this direction t to do this, to get it done. Right. Fact, uh, I just noticed in the, in the Article 3 membership, and this is just some points I want to bring out, one of them on the second last paragraph, all me members who miss three unexcused posted meetings in one year shall be considered to be automatically resigned. Right. I've seen this happen in the past. Give that some thought because you're going to run into, I don't know how you want to word it, but maybe uh, three unex unexcused absences or something. Right, but right. You're going to get some situation. I guarantee you that there's going to be three people, for, of someone for good reason. They might be away. Who knows what right. it is. And you're not really going to want to get rid of them. Right. But your bylaws say he has to go. So just... No, Th if, you, if, you, if you read a little further, it says, unless exceptional circumstances are made known to the chairman of the board. Okay. So, so there's, there's a little leeway, leeway there. there. There's an exception, okay, to that. We, we, again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but yep. we, again, we need to continue to move on. We need to make votes. And, so, so, and if people aren't showing up, they're not, they're not interested. So but if it's I'm just interested in having interested people yep. that seriously and genuinely want to help the veterans in town I just don't want to fill a board up with space. Yeah, I don't think fill holes. I don't think you're going to run into that. I mean, look at the people behind you. These right. people show yeah. for every single veterans issue on our board, you know, and they fill the the stadium. So right. I think you're going to get some really interested people that are going to give dedication and time to it. So um, I don't know if we're, we're not going to actually vote on the proposal you've put together tonight, but I, I know that full heartedly that we all support it, that we've talked about getting us together, and, and thank you for taking the lead 
to um, taking that next step. I know our veterans agent is in the back um, at the meeting tonight, and I didn't know if you wanted to um, comment or had any thoughts. Yes, sir. Um, you come on up if you'd like. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, fellow board members. Uh, my name is Keith German. I'm the current director of veteran services for the district of Hingham and Situate. I say that now with full confidence as I appeared before you on November 15th, which abate was a little premature. Um, maybe I can also alleviate some of Mr. Kelly's concerns that um, a letter dated only as, as short ago as January 12th, uh, signed by Secretary Nee, uh, approving the district formation. So just a few days ago, several days ago, we, we began the process. Um, again, I was here on November 15th, and um, we discussed the, the forming of the district. Um, at that time, I also remember uh, submitting a bylaw agenda similar to what you see before you now that Mr. Kelly has worked on. Um, it's a little bit different. So I, I rise tonight uh, in support of what he's saying about the, um, the veterans forming a council, it does act as a liaison, it does act as an appendage, if you will, of this office. Without, without the office uh, having the resources of other veterans, it cannot fully accomplish the goals and the missions that it needs to do. Um, I, do I do have some, maybe an exercise in semantics. Uh, I believe the language that Mr. Kelly used from, from Mass General Law Chapter 115, I believe later on, as the district forms up and takes shape, that the nomenclature that's the naming of the board, could, could create a, a, a point of confusion, uh, downrange. Again, it, this is if we continue as a district. Um, I suggest to you, if you're not hard fast to the, to the name, that maybe you sh we could revert to uh, the, Situan Veteran, the Situate Veterans Committee and or the Situan, Situate Veterans Advisory Council. The reason I say this is because, as, he, as Mr. Kelly pointed out, there is a board that would need to form later on. And it's called the District Bo D District Veteran Service Board. I mean, it just could lend us some confusion. I mean, it is just a, an exercise in semantics. Yeah. Um, Veterans Advisory <coughs> Committee or Veterans Advisory Council, either one of those, if you could really take that into consideration because the forming of the board is completely different, completely different of what, what, what Mr. Kelly's trying to accomplish here tonight right. with local veterans. Keith, what I suggest that you do, you know, I think this is in infancy, maybe too early of a word, but it's certainly in the in the growth pattern. So when you take a look at this and give us your feedback on it, and then we'll kick it back to Mr. Kelly and get his feedback. I think what we want, I know what we all want, is a strong, effective council board, whatever we call it. So whatever we need to do to get the wording right and get the the bylaws right. Um, yes, sir. I've I've looked it over. Yeah. I looked it over today. Uh, quite extensively, it, it meets or exceeds exactly what I proposed to you on, right. on November 15th. I, again, if you just would take a, a secondary look at the wording of the title of the of the board, to have two boards later on, may, it may be confusing. Right. That's all. Maybe <coughs> call it a committee uh, or a council. Good. That, that's all. But uh, it it is up to uh, it is up to par and, and should be should be acted on you know as soon as possible. Great. Um, <coughs> I, I, we got the name from Secretary Nee, so not that I pulled it out of the sky. <laughs> right, right. Oh, and it does mean it does it does meet exactly how it's worded. Right. I mean, it almost like you took it right from from the chapter one fifteen. Right. But I, the, the name doesn't yeah. matter to me. It's, it's if, the it's board, if it's not a sticking point, I think you should you should act on it and just change it a little, fine tune that. And just to um, to reiterate um, uh, several times about the um, the forming of the district, um, uh, that that being part time, there will be full time services provided in situate. Here at Situate, let me make that perfectly clear: that the the Department of Veteran Services here in Situate, in part of being part of the district with Hingham, there will be full-time services provided. So, it's kind of a, a misnomer, I guess, if you will. It's going to lead people to believe that they can only show up here, I guess, certain times of the day or half the time, which is not really true. The, the office will be 
the office will function and be staffed as long as the the town hall is open so to me that's that's full-time coverage great and you actually start with your office hours in situate in the next week or so is that right i actually started today i was here today um uh, talking to uh, christine i brought uh, along uh, the benefits clerk from hingham just to go over some of the paperwork to start to get some of those uh, similar items uh, in play so that we can we can both be talking the same lingo i guess it, it'll it'll ease in the transition um and there was, there will be office hours now only because there isn't that agent position filled to as yet um, as that comes up and ramps up to speed and that person becomes fully trained and operational which um, again um, speed is of the essence of that because the annual training for uh, Massachusetts Department of Veterans Service Officers is in March so it would really behoove uh, us as a uh, forming a district to have that man or woman veteran be at that training and uh, be able to absorb and take in all the information that's going to be provided it's quite fast-paced um, it's 100 percent reimbursable to the town that's meals uh, lodging and everything it's out in the western part of the state so it isn't something you could easily commute to so it's, it's meant to do that to bring in all 351 municipalities that participate uh, in chapter 150. great mr murray do you have something yeah i do thank you um just to briefly reiterate some of the points that my colleagues made you know we're all 100% in favor of this. Conley, you mentioned this, and I remember dialoguing with you about it right here. And it is, it is important. I mean, everybody in this room recognizes that we've significantly retooled veteran services in this town pretty rapidly in the last four months. And it's very important just to continue looking forward. And the ideas that you folks are bringing forward to us, the ideas that we've come up with, uh, our, our town administrator, I mean, the, the veterans, uh, um, the, um, the Veterans Council coordination is in the job description for the veterans agent that was written five <coughs> months ago. So we've, we've been on board with this even before you folks even came in. Okay, so it's very important that everybody understand this, that you know, moving forward, we're all on the same side. And um, we just wanna, we, we all just wanna really make that, that point very clear. Keith, it's great to have you on board. Yes, sir. And uh, you know, here and, it, and when Tony asked you when do you start, and you said you already did, and that, that that's a really that's a really good point. Um, just one question that I had about the membership, just getting down to the picky yoon before we get into looking at this, you know, in our next meeting or whenever. I'm just curious: is the board shall be composed with a committee or whatever of, of nine voting members, with an option to expand to 15? I don't care what number you have, but is that is that typical for such councils to have that many? Because it seems like a big number in yes, the sir. sense of, you know, what we have other boards. Correct. Okay, maximum allows 15. That's I know that so. we have 15 in Hingham for the reason that Mr. Norton brought out earlier. Yep. There's always some folks that can't be there, especially sure. during these winter months. We have those folks that summer over, and it's behooving on the others of that committee to keep the, uh, keep the ball rolling, if you will. So. Yep. No, that's uh, great. The board there in Hingham is made up of 15 uh, members. And yep. we have slots, as he pointed out here, I think if you read even further down, the two-thirds members shall be veterans as defined by state and federal re regulations. Yep. We allow for and have on our board three civilians, if you will, non-veterans. And they bring a whole new dynamic to that board. Uh, uh, yep. It makes up a different chasm of, of, of people sure. and a cadre. You know, it's, uh, yep. it's very beneficial having them. They have other points of view, so that's great that you put that in here. I mean, the work he did on this is, is really excellent. That's great. And then the other comment I had was, obviously, with the ending of the, or the near ending or whatever the proper term is of what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq right now, um, there's a lot of emphasis, and that's appropriate, uh, towards the returning women and men. But also, Joe, when you said, you know, how many widows are out there? We know we have 1,500. How many widows? It, and I know you all know this, but, I, but I'm going to be looking to see how much of the extant people are out there that we don't know about um, being brought up? People that are that are already already home, but not in the system that we need to bring in the system. In addition to all the, the new folks coming back, and uh, I think you know the energy that we're seeing here that Keith brings, that you all bring, is is really going to pay off for those people. And one way to find out is we're <coughs> going to have outreach programs. Right. Right. If I could just add a little bit of something about those numbers, um, 
I know that I can only speak from experience, but uh, from what I've learned in, at Department of Veterans Services, it goes really by population. It doesn't go by, and I think this is where you got that data, uh, Mr. Kelly, but you could tell me yourself, uh, where did you get that 1600? Is that from the census here in town? Mm -hmm. Okay, just to draw some light to that, that's a self-reporting. Okay, that means you're self-reporting, you're checking that block on a town census. Okay. A veteran, as we saw further down in his Article 3, where it says, per state and federal law, is completely different on what the boots on the ground person thinks. For instance, if I served three years in the National Guard down on Central Street in Hingham with the 1058 Transportation Company, and I get out, believe it or not, after those three years, I am not a veteran unless I've been mobilized. There's all sorts of pieces and parts that go with that. So I, I just want to bring that to your all attention. That 1600 is a self-reported number that has no vetting. There's been no vetting process on that. And there is proven data that veterans of the Vietnam era refused to put anything on that block. So there's a whole other avenue of people you don't have. So what the state uses as a matrix is to say that there is one veteran in need for every thousand. That's a proven formula. So I believe the last count I got here in Situate was 18,500 for a population roughly. Yes. So we're looking at actually one veteran per thousand that's in need. That means veteran and or widow. So those qualifiers and, and some of that data, I just wanted to point out, could be, could be misleading. Mm -hmm. um, just a point, of, you know, a point of order, I guess, right. so you know. And just to add to that, we've had less than a quarter of that even that estimate is claims over the last couple of years. So there's clearly a segment of the, of the population that we're, we're just missing. Did no, anyone else? Thank you. So um, thank you for coming in. I don't know if, one second, Bob, um, if there's anything else that you wanted to add. I think it's important, it's important to push it because it'll obviously get it done quicker, but I think we're on the fast track anyways. So, but, you know, we all tell you, if, if you find that it's slowing down in the process and you think that we can do anything to expedite it, please come in and talk to us again. But I know that we're interviewing people right now for the part-time position, and I know that we can get this passed very quickly within the next couple of weeks, and then I think, uh, you know, we're on our way. Well, if I may, yes. uh, I don't think you need uh, a veteran service officer in place before the Veterans Council is in place. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I would much rather see us in place and then to help the veteran service officer. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna get into it, but I also bring a lot to the table with the experiences that I've been gone through. But to kind of make sure that we hustle this along, I'm just gonna read uh, some pieces from an article that was recently uh, published in the ledger. The number of suicides among soldiers have been leveling off, but there have, has been a dramatic jump in domestic violence, mm -hmm. sex crimes, and destructive behavior. In, in, the, in a force that has been stressed by a decade of war, a new army report said. Suicides among soldiers in active duty guard and reserves totaled 278 last year, down 9%. That's a good thing, I guess, but still 278 people committed suicide as, after they came back from war. But violent sex crimes and domestic violence have increased more than 30% since 2006 and child abuse 43 percent increase since 2006. After 10 years of war with an all-volunteer force, and that's what we're dealing with, an all-volunteer force, you're going to have problems that no one could ever have forecasted. So we need to move quick. There's some people out there that need our help and guidance and support and direction, okay? Because they're not gonna, I know, I know for a fact, they're not gonna come and ask for it. When my son was in the National Guard, there were certain things that was were available to him and his family, never got involved. They just don't get involved. They don't involve their family, they're just a bunch of proud people, that's about it, that's all I can say. But we wanna be able to help and support them, okay? And again, when we see a soldier in uniform, we honestly wanna say thank you for your service. And Hopefully you guys can, you know, get this ball rolling and rolling pretty quick because we can't, we just can't wait much longer. That's right. Okay. You, you, the last thing that I'd say, and then Trisha, um, what we can do at this point in time, if you are interested in serving on this commission or committee or whatever we end up calling it, you know, start filling out some paperwork and getting it to the board, to Kim, 
um, so that you know we can move pretty quickly and we can start appointing people. I know in your proposal that there's a couple of man or um, a couple of positions that will be filled in terms of um, the commanders of the of right. the, the programs and and the Gold Star families, um, but there still are many open spaces that we need names for. No, I, I don't. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if the the, uh, the town needs to post some sort of an announcement in the newspaper about this. This might be just it. I think we just did. <laughs> <laughs> They're all there. Okay. Um, Tricia, did you have something to add? Uh, just a few <coughs> things um, in terms of, you know, reminding folks they don't have to come to the selectmen's meeting. As Keith pointed out, the office is staffed Monday through Friday, and I encourage you to contact the selectmen's office and speak with Chris with any concerns. The second thing, as Keith also noted, is we just got our approval for the Veterans District 10 days ago. So we couldn't hire anybody until the district was approved. Because if the district wasn't approved, we'd be hiring a full-time officer as opposed to the 20 hours a week. So that being said, as soon as we got the approval, and uh, Secretary Nee called me personally right after his meeting with you, Mr. Kelly, uh, conveying your concerns. And we readily agreed, as the board has just informed you tonight, to that. And Keith, as he mentioned, it also provided to the board um, in November. Um, and the interviews for the Veterans Service Officer are in the process of being scheduled for next week. So um, although it seems perhaps that um, you haven't heard much, there's been a lot going on behind the scenes, and I would certainly encourage you to contact the office with any questions, because um, I think you've heard from the board and, and clearly from the staff that works in town hall. Um, we've done a lot in four months. We have a lot to do, but we can't do it without the help of all you folks as well. So thank you for your help. Well, again, just to be perfectly clear, I'm not here to push blame on anyone or point fingers. I'm here to help. Yep. My wife and I That's are terrific. here to help. We yep. genuinely want to help. We want to get it going. That's what we're living for. Okay? That's our mission. Great. And we appreciate it. Thank you. Good job, sir. Thanks, Great. Keith. Thanks Jim, for coming. How are you? <clears throat> How are you? Good to see you. You look good. You look good. You look good. Yes, good to see you. Everything <laughs> going good. Yeah. Cut my own hand. Yeah. <laughs> good to see you, Jim. Office, could we make sure that that is a situate veteran that's going to be given that part-time job? Um, well, we're going to be interviewing the people, the candidates that come before us, and we'll, we'll, you know, pick the first. Fir Just a suggestion. Sir. Yeah. Great. They'll definitely be taken into consideration. Thank you. Great. So we'll move on to item number five, Thank you. which is a discussion vote in a public hearing on the release of affordable housing unit. Take your time, Mike. We'll we'll let the uh, yep. this group. Mike. Good evening. How are you? Very good. good. Are we ready to roll? We are. All right. Thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, Attorney Mike Hayes, I represent uh, Bob Nadeau, who uh, is the owner and resident of 5-3rd Ag. As I think you have in your package my letter of November 30th, uh, which was prior to the uh, planning board holding a public hearing regarding Mr. Nadeau's request to remove the affordability uh, uh, portion of his accessory dwelling. Uh, in 2005, uh, the, uh, Bob got a special permit, or excuse me, did an administrative review uh, for a, an accessory dwelling and had agreed to uh, make it an affordable accessory dwelling. Uh, his aunt uh, lived there for uh, six years uh, until uh, it, 
was necessary for her to to uh, move to uh, the life care center. At that time, uh, Bob was working with Laura Harbottle, our town planner, and putting together an ad uh, to get a uh, begin the process of getting an affordable tenant in the accessory portion of the property. Uh, Simultaneous with that, Bob went on a business trip. He works for Fidelity. Uh, and as a result of that uh, business trip, he was told that Fidelity is moving his operation out of the Commonwealth. And he had the opportunity to either relocate or retire. Uh, and as you can see, he's a young man, way too young to retire, uh, and uh, uh, needs, needs and wants to work. So he has agreed to relocate to uh, the South. Uh, so that is the purpose of our uh, application to the planning board and before the selectmen. The, uh, the planning board about 10 days ago granted uh, a uh, new special permit uh, for the property to keep the uh, accessory dwelling portion uh, of the uh, uh, property intact as an accessory dwelling. It met and meets all requirements of the bylaw regarding accessory dwellings. Uh, the issue uh, uh, before them and you is uh, the town's uh, willingness to release the restrictive covenant uh, on that this be an affordable unit. Uh, and the board of uh, the planning board's um, special permit is contingent upon this board releasing that. Uh, restriction. Um, I can tell you, um, uh, number one, that the uh, accessory unit has never been established as an affordable unit. Uh, it has never been part included in our affordable calculations. And it's never been part of the 10 percent. And uh, the reason for our request, frankly, is, is hardship for Mr. Nadeau. Uh, he uh, has placed the property on the market. Uh, in a very difficult uh, 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 housing market, as you all know. Uh, the affordability portion of the uh, accessory dwelling is a huge hindrance to its marketability, and he, he has an offer on the table uh, through a relocation company. Uh, a young couple with a child and uh, one of the uh, couple's uh, parents who will live in the property uh, in the, uh, as an accessory uh, to, the, to the main uh, house. Uh, but uh, that deal is also contingent upon the release of the affordability restriction. So we're here to ask your uh, assistance and, and uh, uh, happy to answer any questions. And Bob will too. Great. Um, who wants to start? You can start with Joe, it doesn't matter. What no, I, I really don't have any questions at all. I, uh, I concur in this, in, in this time, especially these economic times, uh, you know, we're not, certainly not here to, to hurt, to hinder people. Uh, and I think if we can help uh, Mr. Nadeau by doing this, then we should do it. Can I ask a question to the town planner? Yes. That, Laura, um, as an accessory dwelling, how is that, uh, shall we say, guaranteed that it's maintained in that capacity going forward, just in a general proposition. General, right. Not affordable. Correct. Um, just through the special permit, I guess the reinforcement of the special permit. In other words, that it's, it's based on, on um, shall we say, the good faith of the per people who live there that it's maintained as an accessory dwelling? No, it's if somebody's getting it for their in-law or something, how is that guaranteed that in 10 years or 15 years down the road, it doesn't turn into an apartment. Oh, there's, there's no restriction on that in the zoning. They can go either way. The right. relative would be just rented. One sec. If, if I may. One sec. Let, show, are you this, is my, this is my difficulty, and I know I'm probably the one that's going to be the one that has to say it. Um, what you did when you did this in 2005 was a commendable thing. I even read the minutes that. Uh, Mark Fenton said it was. What you, the steps you took is something that's unusual in this town, and that's to be commended. The difficulty I have is that given our 
lack of affordable housing in the town. When we have an opportunity to make a unit, a house, some kind of residence affordable, to take that away, it's difficult. I understand it hasn't gone to the numbers and qualified, and I understand the difficulty you're going through, and I, I don't, and obviously it's a difficult position to be in. I just, it's hard for me in my position to say once we have something that we desperately need for people situate to take it away. That's, that's my difficulty. And, and I'm not saying that you, you, you stood up and you, you, you did it with a family member. My big fear, though, is, is when you look at in the future, is it going to turn into basically apartments? Somebody is not going to honor the accessory law, or in this case, this would be the um, affordable component. Um, it, it, it's a problem, because now what, what, what would have only been a single family house on a 17,000 square foot lot which you're only allowed to have one because it's in the 10,000 square foot zone. Now we're going to have two, and then somebody takes adva advantage of it. That's my difficulty. Takes advantage of it, turns it into an apartment house. Has two places there when they would never have gotten in the first instance. Um, Laura, you can possibly correct me, but I believe under this permit, the, it has to be owner occupied. Yes, it, it is, and I understand that. But I'm saying going forward, what are the safeguards to ensure not you, but whoever buys it in the future is owner occupied? And and I've seen it where we just don't have the um, enforceability to ensure that that's the case. It's, you know, so I guess... <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, Mr. Harris? The in-law apartment's only 400 square feet, right? 400, it's about 425 to 450 square feet. I think feet. that, John, might, you know, I, I know what you're saying, but that might satisfy me that, you know, it's going to be remain as an in-law apartment or, or something like that that sense. I happened to walk into the planning board meeting and they were about halfway through this article and I had heard the name. I haven't heard that name in 35 years. I think I delivered the newspaper to your house when I was a kid so I, I knew exactly where the house was. But um, And I, I had called Laura on this because I was unsure myself and spoke to Neil about it and you know it's just I don't have a problem with this. It's you know it's uh, like you say it's in proportion. I saw Mrs. Tatum's concerns when you were before the planning board and all of that, and it's and it's there. It's it's built, and you know, so it makes the world go round. And again, you know, when I did this seven years ago, I had no idea I'd be moving out or have to move. Um, the real fly in the ointment here is that the relocation company will not take possession of it. They have to take it from me and then sell it to the to the, to the owners for IRS rules, and they will not take it with the, with that deed restriction on it. So I'm really, you know, I'm in a, in a bind here. Um, the intention was we we're going to, you know, make it affordable and help the town any way we could. I'm just, you know, I'm being forced to relocate. Not my choice. Mr. Murray, did you have? Um, no, I'm good. Okay. I, get, I understand John's point, and it's not just your situation. It's many many situations to come before us where we make a change and then all of a sudden two years from now someone comes back and says well you did it for there and the circumstances are different um, so that's kind of what our job is is to kind of look out for that sort of stuff but um, I think I agree you know in your generosity many years ago you tried to help the town you know it didn't end up getting into the numbers for some reason but you tried to help the town by helping with the affordability factor and and now you're in a situation where that's coming back to hurt you, and that was never the intention. So um, I think I agree with, with um, the opinions up here that it's something that you know, is the right thing to reverse. Um, any other motion? Further comments? No? Uh, Mr. Hayes, you may want to. I just want to make one quick comment. And, and under the terms uh, of the, the restrictive covenant that's in place and has been in place since 2005, the uh, affordability restriction will expire in f 15 years from that date regardless. Um, so, I mean, we're halfway through that in any event. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's your decision and, and we're, Mr. Nadeau is asking for your assistance. That's a good point. Okay, motion? Mm. Motion for Jim. Yes, please. Uh, move the Board of Selectmen vote to approve the release of the accessory unit located at 5 3rd Avenue as permitted by Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 184, Section 32. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. It's four to one, and it passes. Good luck with your relocation. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, uh, with your permission, I could uh, work with uh, Trish in a, a release of the restriction, or it, unless the town has a, a form that they would generally use, I'd be happy to forward one for her in your review. Yeah. If Maybe, I, I don't, uh, Trisha? Trish, should he fill out a, want him to get a document together? You might want him, Mike, to do it. I'll tell you Probably. why, because it's going to have to go to town council. It's land court. Yeah, we could look at it to town council. And land court is, is and yeah. I, think. I only say that, Mike, because being land court, it's going to be whatever they want the to release it. Is you're going to do clear, it. So the reverse should be just as clear, I think. Yeah. If that's okay with you. No, I'm happy to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. <coughs> Move on to uh, item number six, <coughs> which is. Um, Fiscal year 13 budgets and articles. Shellfish, right? So we'll start with uh, shellfish. It's uh, 295. Like Mr. Chair, we're digging here. Okay, yeah, got it. Our annual visit. How are you? Great. I, what we've been doing is just giving people 75 seconds to kind of give a quick spiel about what you do, what you did good, what you want to complete, and then jump to the numbers. So. <coughs> If you have any comments on, uh, well, the shellfish beds in the South River opened up for the first time in 20 years uh, this past year. That's a victory, and we're working on trying to get them extended so it's actually in the summer season, but uh, that's a reach right now. Uh, budget that I have here is bare bones, same as last year. So, uh, Joe, did you find this year we were open less or more than last year? It's about the same. The red tide seems to <laughs> come in at the end of May every year and uh, cuts well, the season a little bit short by a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But everything opened up on December 1st again. Not a lot of diggers, needless to say. But uh, <coughs> we're working, and Marsh was working too, to try to get the season from September 1st as opposed to December 1st. Uh, and we're working with the state because this Division of Marine Fisheries does all the testing and is responsible for that. But uh, that would be nice if we could extend the season a couple more months, particularly in the fall, which is a nice time to go. Right. Winter great. digging is not fun. No. Not during December. <laughs> no, there are a couple of guys, I guess, from Norway who fell in like a sinkhole trying to walk out from 3A. Really? <laughs> oh. Dangerous. That's <laughs> just a question. <laughs> not about the budget. Um, Mr. Strauss says, um, Mr. <laughs> it's, we can dig seven days a week. Just has to be over 32 we degrees. Over that I, I'm just confirming. My, my, you can dig right? any day. It's only right. once during the week that you can get a bucket there. You can't get seven. No, buckets. I know that. I'm just, I just right. wanted to, thought yeah. it has to be over 32 degrees. Right? Preferably. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Just I'm not going to go with the thermometer, but you know. No, all right. We I don't just want was to. asking. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, this will be a short one. Yep. Last year's budget was 11,284. You got a whopping increase of uh, $55 up to 11,399, 39. Um, obviously flat, any questions? No. Oh, oh. Great, keep up the great work. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. See you. Thanks, Joe. We'll move on to uh, Harbor Master and the Waterways Enterprise Fund. Which is 298. Is that in the waterways? The They're in the back. Here we go. Last one. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm Murphy. John. Mark Dotson. I'm the Situate Harbor Master. I'm here tonight with John Murphy, who is the chairman of the Situate Waterways Commission. And um, briefly, you, you, you know, what we're <coughs> uh, basically all about is um, you know, our mission is to 
ensure the safety of the boating public, uh, to promote order among the vessels that moor in transit to Twin Harbor, um, and also to maintain and care for all the critical maritime facilities uh, and infrastructure in the harbor in support of the commercial and recreational fleets, uh, and also um, to defray the cost of providing all of those services um, by the assessment of user fees, um, which we do. This is an enterprise fund. Um, our budget this year, um, we're actually requesting um, the bottom line a little bit less than we did last year. Um, a little bit more in personnel, um, but less in the purchase of services than the purchase of materials and supplies. And our, our debt for the first time in several years has also gone down. Um, so I think that we're in pretty good shape. Our bottom line, our, our forecasted numbers, um, do still fall sh about $32,000 short of our predicted projected revenues. Um, that's if we spend every dime that we're appropriated and only bring in what we've conservatively forecasted. If that turns out to be the case, um, then that difference will have to be made up through retained earnings, uh, which is currently uh, at about $580,000. So we could comfortably absorb that. Um. Just Mark, before you start, your number's about 170000 too high on the retained earnings. You had several transfers at the uh, annual and special. So your retained earnings for purposes of the FY13 budget are 411000 411 Because we needed to move, um, <coughs> for the budget that you projected, we need to move 89000 out of retained earnings for FY13 and for capital items as well. So um, I just, and again, remember we talked about threshold balances in the retained earnings, so. Um, so, so Trisha, that 411 is prior to the $89,000. So his FY13 budget is approved and the capital, then the retained earnings after everything is said and done would be 411. So just so, so that includes the deficit of $89,000. Yes. Okay, so. Because we need to move that out of retained earnings just to meet the operating budget that you and I have proposed. I understand, yeah. Yep, okay. So his number was right, but then we have to back out all the things that the new budget you're looking at tonight contemplates. Right. Any uh, general comments? Yes, Mr. Just, Mayor. Yeah, I'm just, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the retained earnings, is that the lowest we've been in a while? Uh, for $400,000. That seems. Seems low to me, and it concerns me a bit. If we, yeah, I do believe 411 is the lowest we've been in a number of years. Um, going back a few years with the uh, purchase of the Marine Park, yeah. we had um, projected at that time that we would be um, having to dip into the retained earnings because uh, our projections at that time um, brought us up with a shortfall for the mm -hmm. uh, ensuing fiscal years. We haven't had a shortfall um, during that time. We've continued to make a profit during each and every one of those fiscal years. Um, so while the retained earnings have gone down slightly because we've had to move um, some of those monies for commitments, um, we we do continue to be fiscally solvent. But yes, I think Joe, that you're right. Uh, that 411 is the lowest number we've faced in a few years. Yeah, and just uh, and I just bring this up because we certainly and I don't anticipate this happening at all. But we don't want to see ourselves get into a position as we are with some of the other enterprise funds, where we're dipping into taxpayers' money to pay for them, and, and we're $400,000 away from that. And I, that's a long way to go in some respects, but a, a couple of unexpected uh, issues in the harbor could, could wipe that 400 out pretty quick, and I wouldn't want to see that. So I think we just, <coughs> I bring this up only to say, let's keep an eye on it, that's all. And I think the way to buffet that, since we're taking 90 to just fund the FY13 budget out of retained earnings, is his capital requests are decidedly lower. I mean, my recommended, as opposed to his submitted, <laughs> um, a very low in compared with prior years, just for that 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 reason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Well, in light of that topic, uh, I do have a subject that I've been wanting to address, and I've known in the past we've talked about it, but this year I'm actually want it addressed, and that is the um, slips. You know, you've done a wonderful job. Both of you guys have done a wonderful job. But the slips off of Cole Parkway, out of, you know, obstructing views for people, 
and I think it's it's time now that we we find another location for them. And that may be a cost. But it's a cost that I think the town would be better served if we didn't have all those up there. So I, I think I'd like to see this year when the um, docks are pulled out that we can find some other location. I know I've talked to uh, Al at DPW about it, and you know we can work together and try to find something. But they've got to go. It's just it's the worst location to put them up. So I hope that becomes one of the priorities. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot on the plate, but I think it's something that the town ultimately would benefit by year-round. So um, it's something that we can look at. It's basically a, it's a function of time and money. You know, the time and the money that it takes to uh, take them from Cole Parkway and bring them someplace else. Um, so we just need to figure out where that place is and what that number is, and then we can approach it. We'll be working with you on that, Denmark. Thank you. Thanks. Just, just if I may follow up, and, and, not, and not to be contrary here, but after the last discussion we had on this. Uh, there is another side to the issue, and there are people uh, who don't have a problem with the slips, with, with them being there, the uh, docks. So I just want to know. It's not as easy as we think uh, to do it. There is people who say we're a nautical town, we are a boating community, it's part of the overall ambiance or setting of a, of, of a harbor community. I so have I've heard it. comments uh, both for yeah. and against. I, just, I bring that up just to balance the <coughs> well, I, think I, must, I think the point is is that and Mr. Patterson and I and we've all talked about this is let's see what the options are so we can then make a decision and let's see what they would cost there might be some rather than necessarily trucking them somewhere else which might be the Cadillac version where the Cadillac cost maybe we can rearrange them so they don't block the water view and they're moved somewhere else on Cole Parkway in a different aspect that would have a smaller footprint and certainly not cover things up maybe that doesn't work at all maybe you know, they would have to be moved somewhere else but let's just gather the data and find out how much it costs but then we can revisit personally um, I agree with John on this one I'd like to see that addressed but you know let's gather the data and see what see what comes out of it and I agree I think you know it it can go down to the right a little ways just to give you at least a view of the mouth of the river so um, but if you can get us back a few a few different options that'd be great when the time comes again um, ju jumping to the numbers uh, you know Joe mentioned the retained earnings um, and I know when we looked at the proposal when I was on the advisory committee whatever how many years ago that was you know that there were years of negative um, revenue or income that we're going to dump uh, hit into your retained earnings I don't um, my first question is on 12, are those numbers accurate? Are we going to have a deficit of about $100,000 in this fiscal year? I, I, I think not. I think it's um, just a similar situation. We, had, we faced a similar situation in FY11 where we projected a, de uh, a deficit. We ended up um, with a profit of about $170,000. So I think what it is is we, we, um, we take sort of a conservative look at our revenues. Um, and with our expenditures, um, that's the, the amount that's appropriated is the maximum amount that we've, we will spend. Um, we try not to spend any money that we don't have to. Um, and so, uh, as I've said, while we've projected some shortfalls the last few years, we haven't yet had to dip into the retained earnings for that reason. Um, so I suspect and, and uh, project that FY12 will be the same. Right. Well, if you look at your projections for fiscal year 2013, your revenue is over $100,000 less than what you actually got in 2011. Yeah, that's right. And I think that one of the, the big number there is the um, premium from the sale of bonds. I spoke to Jane about that this year, and mm -hmm. I don't know that if we're going to be seeing that in FY13 or not. That was sort of, um, that was kind of an anomaly in FY11. It was, it was a nice thing to have. Right. Now, are all of our slips out, sold, and we've we're got them as many as we can have in the harbor? We're not waiting for any new ones to come in? We're, we're, we've maxed out our footprint. All of our slips are full. Demand is still robust. We've got over 100 people on the waiting list um, who are looking to get into the <coughs> municipal marinas this coming boating season. Right. And the only other thing that, that I think I would like to see and I think other people have discussed is, you know, one way to make more revenue is raising the price per foot of the stuff. So I don't know. You've probably considered it. I know that's not been the um, our goal in past years, but it may, in, l in light of having deficits every year it may be something to consider to see if we raise up and what the market is and all that sort of stuff so um, I think with uh, retained earnings you know at about four hundred thousand um, dollars I think mr. Norton's comments are right on um, 
that's not you know four hundred eleven thousand dollars is really one catastrophic event um, so it's not a huge cushion so I think that your comments are, are right on if I may um, a lot of this money over the years I mentioned I think it was eight years ago that we bought the marine park right now unless something else comes up I think our last three projects coming up this spring the marine park will be done by July 1st everything should be done over there two out of those three projects are um, funded by CPC and the other one we have a grant paying 40% of that cost so not a lot of costs incurred coming up these final three projects but hopefully by July 1st the marine park is completed it looks great um, one other quick comment in terms of the financials is the debt service is almost 50% of your expense yep. so is that is anything dropping off that you know would it be nice to see is the next five years what you're projecting so we can see if in, indeed that return excuse me retained earnings disappears um, I, I do have those numbers without what was it yeah, it's the fun. Good point. we are for the but um, this is the coming fiscal year for the first time seeing a reduction in our, in our debt. Um, and it does continue to go down from there. So while it's still a big number and a big percentage of the budget, uh, at least it's going in the right direction. Great, and it is right here. Great. Any questions, Mr. Harris? Uh, Mark, on, on the revenue side, why would the um, lease income go down am I reading it right it goes down uh, fiscal year 11 from 103 to 74 is that the lease from the marine park it, go, it, it goes from uh, 103 and FY 11 <coughs> and um, the FY 12 number if we're both looking at the same uh, number is the year to date number okay all right um, the is projection for that from for, for the end of the year will be the same as FY 11 103 249 great thank you and that is the um, boatyard lease and the Coast Guard uh, the building, Coast Guard building that's next door to the Harbor Master's office in Cold Parkway. They own the building. They built that building. We just lease them the land. Is that correct? No, thank you. Um, one other quick question on the appropriation of water and sewer. Yes. That obviously went down considerably. Is that because we put it in the budget last year and this year it's yes. it's going because of the town department? So it's relatively flat, you know, the, the, it, your expenditures went from 1,123 down to 1,108,000, um, 30 plus thousand of that is because debt has gone down that amount. Um, other than that, it's a relatively flat budget. Any other questions from the board? Any other comments from you guys? Um, no, I just wanted to, you know, take the opportunity to thank the board, thank the town administrator, thank the Waterways Commission. Um, pleasure to work uh, with such a great community. And um, hopefully, coming year will be as well as last fiscal year. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, John. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> See you, guys. Never heard of the outfit. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's still your line. Mike, who are you? Funny. Why, Mike? <laughs> funny. But, yeah. Brought my protection with me. Yeah. Yeah. Say, here's right. a cast of characters. <laughs> hey, so all the big what do we prove? do? That's here. it. That's fine. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, we're smaller, but we're slower, too. Yeah. <laughs> Al, I'll let you take the lead and see how you want to break this up. But Okay, I thought we would uh, We'll just start right with the Department of Public Works, start with the uh, brief discussion of the uh, introductory remarks. I'll talk to the administration, and then we'll turn it over to Kevin to talk engineering. Mike will talk um, grounds and highway. Um, we can talk snow budget, street light budgets, and then we'll go through the three enterprises. Right. All right, kind of more or less in the order that, that they're in your book, I believe. Um, and how uh, how would you like to, what would, I can talk forever on any subject, yes, whether I know much seconds. about it or not. So, you know, I'm never, never bashful about that. But I, I really would like to meet your needs to explore the budget, understand it better, or whatever. I think initially, if you just want to tell us what a couple of your major accomplishments were, 
and then a couple of your goals for this year, and then we can get into the okay. you know, details of it. All right, fine. Um, let me go to department accomplishments, and that's the, that's the sum total of the DPW. It's not any one individual's accomplishment. In many, t many cases, it's a team accomplishment uh, with engineering supporting sewer, uh, sewer supporting water, highway supporting uh, the other two, other three or four. Uh, but basically, I guess one thing is that we want to be right up front about it is that we we've, we've, uh, are able to feed our budgets and to generate additional free cash in the three enterprises. So the three, all three enterprises um, are on a sound footing. If you remember the transfer station a few years ago was on a, a deficit basis. Now it's on, definitely on a uh, sound basis, generating enough uh, free cash to fund its own capital for re necessary replacements of equipment that is wearing out. The same thing is, as, is true of the uh, sewer enterprise and the, and the water enterprise is, is another bright spot for us. Um, we have a number of energy projects that we're implementing. You're much you're well aware of the solar and the wind turbine and this ESCO project that are coming along. Uh, the water department has done an outstanding job of um, of uh, combating the uh, brown water problem that has pl plaguing the town. The number of complaints uh, in the last year dropped to 25 percent of the complaints from the previous year. Um, we can attribute that to the water flushing work that was done, the replacement of miles of pipes, three miles of water pipes. Uh, and really the reduced imp the impact of reducing the amount of water used for irrigation. And I know we'll, we'll explore that later in February when the Water Resource Commission comes before you. But uh, what, we're, what, been, what Jim's been able to accomplish is reduce the demands on the system so that we're not pumping at such high pressure through such small pipes. The result is we had 25 percent, we, we had one-fourth of the water main breaks in this last year compared to the year before. Now, water main breaks still are problems for us, but we had one-fourth of those because we're not stressing the system so hard. Um, we completed the uh, sewer expansion to the Roses Lane area, uh, and now we're ex expanding the sewer to another 310 homes in the Musquashkid area. That's placing a demand on, on water, sewer, highway, and engineering. Um, we uh, rebuilt because we were able to get more funding for highway work, we rebuilt uh, Clap Road, Booth Hill, Hollett, Tilden, plus portions of Country Way and Mordecai Lincoln. So I think our residents are beginning to see that our roads are no longer universally in a, such a dismal condition with no hope of digging our way out of it. So we feel good about those roads that we've uh, been able to get in place. We implemented the new, last winter, we implemented the new brine pretreatment system and increased the number of town vehicles and personnel plowing. Um, we, in the area of uh, sewer I and I work, we implemented some uh, changes uh, in how we were approaching that by hiring an engineering firm to help us. Uh, the result is we were getting ready to go out with a significant project to reduce I and I that we find the primary source of I and I now is coming from the, the pipes between the street and the house and we have a program we're putting in place for that. And also the reason this I and I is important is because I and I is the cheapest new sewer capacity available to us. Getting non-revenue water, free water that's, that's going into the sewer system out enables us to hook up more houses and gain the revenue from that. Al, can you refresh me? Who's the engineering firm doing that? Tie and Bond. Gotcha. Great. Perfect. Thank you. And one other thing, the percentage is, is mind-boggling. Give us the percentage again of the... Well, <coughs> our connected customers uh, <coughs> generate about $750 million million a thousand seven yeah thousand. three seven hundred fifty thousand gallons a day of in of water flowing into the sewer plant on rainy days that will go up to 2.7 million gallons and that's all non-revenue water coming in which needs to be treated it goes into the north river and importantly it comes out of our uh, water table so that's water that, that's in the ground that can be used for other purposes such as um, pumping into freshwater wells. Okay, so we're draining the water table with this, with this uh, amount of <coughs> inflow. Some of that sump pumps, which are illegally connected to the sewer, and we'll be back to you with a program to uh, tackle, tackle that in about a month. I think you'll like that program. Uh, we then we re revitalize the street acceptance process. We have six new public roads uh, on board. Um, 
And in the course of the last year, we onboarded numerous new people, uh, two engineers, a water superintendent, uh, two water plant licensed operators, a new operator in the uh, sewer plant, and three new licensed equipment operators in the, in the highway and grounds. And uh, I guess the last thing is, uh, I think we've improved finally uh, f the environmental quality and the human safety uh, in the Musquashkit Pond area and enable us to go forward with the sewer. I think that <coughs> pond is now a healthy, vital pond. We've seen good uh, uh, changes in the bird life, uh, uh, the aquatic life, uh, the absence of midge problems this summer, uh, the green stuff floating on top is gone, and now we have a tidal estuary that's functioning as a tidal estuary and it's, a, it's healthier for our people and of course healthier for the environment, so we're, we're happy with that. Great. Um, so why don't, other than that, how are you gonna top that this year? <laughs> mm. Good point. Um, why don't we break off one the top piece and talk about the administrative budget. Okay. Um, uh, last year it was $122,000. This year it's $206,000. Um, the increase in that is the uh, addition of a facilities manager, mm -hmm. um, a position that the board voted strongly in favor of last year and you can see that we still think it's important because it's in the budget again this year so um, with all the projects that are going on the ESCO stuff the um, um, the plans that we have in terms of improving the town I think this is a position that is yep. highly needed other than that it's pretty flat other than that it's just standard uh, keep the Xerox machine running uh, pay for some secretarial services excellent secretarial services um, a little bit of training postage that sort of thing so it's a any questions on that component no, no. Not right. One thing I might say is that this budget is in part charged out to the various enterprises as well. So the transfer, sewer, and water all pay a portion of this budget. Right. Okay, so now just in, so that was that component, which is also in this totality one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to look at the totality. I think maybe we should go through as you're component, suggesting. Sure administration then go to engineering okay engineering is that and I turn that over to Kevin Caffrey so that's 411 so yeah. <coughs> well, Kevin anything you want to use your well I'll use most of your 75 uh, seconds I'll, yeah I'll cover most of everything that uh, that we could bring up but um you know, if there's any questions about the budget, there is an item there for $400,000 that's included in there for streets and seawalls. Right. Um, and that is the override money. Um, so, um, relatively flat, uh, $697,000 last year, um, $705,000 this year. Most of that is in just uh, cost of living increases and, and on the payroll side of things. Um, and I do see that, again, as in last year, there's $400,000 in there for um, the override money that is to fix seawalls and to improve our streets, as we said that would go to. So I'm glad to see that's in there. And Tony, there's also 100000 in there uh, in the admin for the public facilities. There was 100000 the override for the basement area. And as that money is we retrofit there or roll over, that'll be used for other things like joint dispatch or whatever. Good point. Let me uh, look back there real in the admin side? It's on it's under admin, yeah. So the last detail sheet, um, the last page before it gets to the personnel update, it says retrofit basement storage a hundred thousand, roads and sea walls four hundred thousand. Oh, in the, you're talking about in the totality. Yeah, one. right. Yeah, okay. not in the end. Right. Great. Any questions? Uh, yes, Rick. Yeah, regarding the $400,000 for roads and seawalls, um, which obviously is a great thing, um, we thank the town for provide their wisdom in providing that funding in the context of the override. But how are you going to decide which roads and what the road seawall balance, not only which roads and which seawalls, but the road seawall balance, because this is going to be doing this each year. I'm just sort of interested, since this is the 
second year or the first real full year of doing this, what, what process do you have in place for assessing prioritizations? Well, we have, we have two things that we're going to follow. One is we're going to do a road management program and try to come up with a plan where we can rate a lot of our different streets and see how we're going to do the streets. Our first priority is that we're going to be looking to repair the breach. And depending on how much money has to go in to repair that from the sums that we have, when that contract goes out to bid, we will take that and might take away from the roadside, but we feel that's the most important to get completed first. We are also looking at another project around the lighthouse, which is with CPC money, and that's going to be new armor stone to raise the grade of the armor stone around the front of the lighthouse and bring it back in. And our idea is to then protect the parking lot by taking, it's kind of a, um, a rabbly like loose wall that's there now mm -hmm. on that side and maybe removing that and placing a um, actual concrete wall there. And we have some CPC money for that area and would raise it up another couple feet, um, but we would probably try to balance the rest of that job out with, with the funds that we have and kind of judge it where we go. Those are two projects we're looking to get done. And that sounds fine, but how did you prioritize that those are the two that you want to do this year versus put it all into other roads or well, or the, the other other seawalls. We did a, we did a seawall evaluation. We do have a seawall yeah. evaluation that we have. I just got the first draft of it last week. Mm -hmm. um, but that CPC money is available, and if we have to add some supplemental money to to continue that on, I think that's a good spending of the money. And and I feel the breach. We we have to get right. in there and repair sure. that. Okay, thank you. So, priorities where they are. Got it. Thank you. And you also kind of have two years worth of monies to use if you need to correct correct for 12, we, have we haven't used right 12 yet and you'll have 13 coming right down the right right so a more substantial project coming down. any other comments on that budget nope. great thanks Kevin the next one is the highway department turn that over to Mike Breen mr. Breen how are you Anything you want to mention that Al skipped? Yeah. No? Just some, some upcoming work that we, you know, hope to get in. Uh, in the, uh, our goals are to try to get First Parish Road from the railroad tracks to Front Street. Um, Stockbridge Road, um, we would complete, you know, fix that trench and, and complete that road on Stockbridge. Hopefully we can get to Common, um, Common Street and Captain P.S. from uh, the railroad tracks to till the road is a goal we're going to try to get this year. And also implement a um, preventive maintenance uh, repairs on some of the roads that are halfway decent, and get some crack seal undone, and and get a list of roads like uh, Kevin and Al said about the roadway maintenance plan. Right now, I'm just going around assessing the roads that are halfway decent that we can save and get a few more years out of. And then I'm working with a, a contractor to come up with a plan on how much it's going to cost and try to get those repaired. Now, those streets that you mentioned, are you talking about repaving them completely? Sean? I was just going to mention, I'm sure you've spoken to Fran Conroy. That's just what he <coughs> does. That's it. That's all. That's the contractor. Rick? Yeah, with the train coming in several years ago, there was that, you know, heyday of, it seemed like every month we were giving an okay for some pocket park somewhere, be it North Situate or Greenbush, and then, you know, uh, the one by the, by the Egypt store. And there's also the Marine Park on there. One of the things several of us have been concerned about is what that's doing to your parks budget and your maintenance budget because everybody loves the park and everybody loves the dedication ceremony, but it's you guys that got to keep it going and fixing it and all that. And I'm wondering how that's working out for you in terms of your budgetary allocations and planning for both financial and manpower and all that sort of stuff. Well, Al's uh, allocated a few extra um, some help, which has been a big help for us. Uh, that's the best paying for your bucks as far as uh, maintaining the, the parks. And it, it's been a little bit more strained, but it's it's been doable with the extra some help. So. Okay. Um, just to summarize the numbers real quick, last year's appropriation was $1,024,000. This year it's a uh, million fifty-two thousand um, dollars. Not a substantial increase. Uh, the majority of it is just uh, um, cola increases in the payroll, and um, <coughs> the 
some rental equipment it went up about twenty thousand dollars I don't know if is that anything specific Al or I'm sorry Mike is that anything specific with the rental equipment and facilities you know what we weren't listening no I apologize. <laughs> first time or the second time? Yeah. well I, I I heard you the second time, but I didn't get enough to know if the clue was where, what one you're pointing to. Uh, the Sorry. rental equipment and facilities just went up uh, 17000 I mean, that's the only... Hi under the highway. Under highway budget? Yeah. I didn't know if that was anything specific. Went from 92000 oh, to 111. Uh, yeah, the... Uh, is now 109000 Yes. Yes. And it went down a little bit? Well, it went up from last year. Oh, okay. Went down from his this. Report. This is I, I can I can this is the. Um, is it the cost of asphalt? This permit requires oh, yeah. that we clean our catch basins with a much greater frequency. It's a drainage. It's a new federally imposed uh, requirement that we do much more drainage outfall cleaning. So we've had to increase the amount of money in this budget for drainage improvements, and it relates to um, uh, keeping water from. Road water from going into wetlands or that sort of thing. So that's that big claw thing that goes in. Yes, and right. Uh, and uh, now that that material has to be disposed of in an environmentally sensitive way. Uh, one of the things we're doing to help with that in uh, in the future is, and we'll talk about this in the snow budget if you'd like, is we've converted to 100% salt in our snow fighting. Uh, if you'll notice now, we've had two minor little storms but there's no sand all over the roads, okay? So uh, that sand ends up in catch basins, which we have to clean, takes longer to clean it, and it's more expensive. So I think overall, uh, we've, we've blunted, blunted the impact with uh, going to salt. It's not just salt, it's brine. Or salt and brine, yeah. <clears throat> right, the brine pre Are still using any solid salt? Okay. Well, this is another example of a mandated expense that comes down into a tight budget and increases it by it's your largest increase of any line item with obviously no revenue source behind it similar to a circuit breaker for the school or you know other mandated programs exactly yep and that, that could be escalating in the future because the state is talking about really increasing the regulations on that where the permanent becomes a lot more stringent and, and you have to have a whole system map and you almost want to make it like it's its own utility system <coughs> water system, you have a storm water system and have it managed and everything else to a real fine extent. Could that be an enterprise expense? It would become, uh, the, some communities are considering drainage as an enterprise. Therefore, the only way you pay for drainage is, in an enterprise is there are fees. So it's a, establishing a fee structure. Hmm. So, yeah. So this, it's a long way to go to get there. But nonetheless, uh, drainage is actually a public utility. You know, we, we know that the power company is a public utility, water is a public utility, but drainage is actually a public utility. It's usually one of those hidden ones that's in the ground. You, you worry well, about my point it. is, could it be the water, price, water enterprise fund? You know, it's not bringing water to, it's taking water away. Um, it, it could be, but it would be, it's probably better managed out of the, out of a, uh, not out of a water. I mean, water is, um, permitting and testing and pumping and that sort of thing. I don't think it would be best to have it's it It's not water. allowed as an auditing. Um, I put it in waterways. Classification. <laughs> <laughs> in the permit structure. Since it well, goes waterways in the ocean. classification. Yeah. Mr. North? Yeah. Uh, uh, just try, just uh, an aside on the unfunded <coughs> mandates at the uh, recent MMA conference in Boston, I, I spoke with an old friend of mine uh, who now is in charge of uh, unfunded mandates with the auditor's office. It encouraged us as situate as well as other towns, of course. Uh, but in speaking to him, he, he encouraged us if we feel we have a, man, a mandate from the state that is any way unfunded illegally, then make sure we get in touch with him and, and uh, he would give it some Good. deep consideration. So, just a thought. Great. Any other questions on this? Okay, we'll move on to Browns. Browns. Oh, back in. Back it up. <laughs> nice try, Mike. Move it fast. <laughs> All right. Any comments on the grounds that haven't been already really? mentioned? Jump 
right to the numbers. Um, last year's appropriation was $958,000. This year's $953,000. Um, some of the equipment went down by $15,000. Payroll went up a little bit. Um, and the biggest decrease was the uh, water and sewer appropriation. Um, which is leaving it relatively flat. Any questions from the board or? Nope. Nope. Okay. No. Did we add any new people in that department? Uh, Have we had any new people? Yeah. No new position. No. Um, Mike has moved out. people around a bit within highway and grounds to better match the skill base of the individual with the work. Mm -hmm. to give more of a career progression for people within his department, which is nice. So people don't always have to do the same thing all the time. Uh, we will be adding, as he mentioned, the two summer hires two for new. purposes of... Uh, for over and above. Yeah, so there so are two new summer people in this. Yeah, if you look under seasonal salaries, it's gone from 34 to 52. Al did want another labor position, which I really wanted to fund because I think it pays because we have more people to do more things. And it cuts down on the private contracting. Um, but it was a little too much of a stretch right now in terms of adding additional personnel when I think the board was of the mind that we want to really put forward the facilities manager position and not create another FTE this year. So with that in mind, we at least gave them the two seasonal. So there used to be seven and now there's nine. Yes. And they're fairly nominal. Great. So that's it for the total DPW budget. We went through all four components. So now we can move on to the um, Water Enterprise Fund. Are you snow and ice? We go in order uh, we can, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I skipped snow and ice. Yeah. Why don't we do that snow real quick? Uh, snow and ice. Um, Mike manages that. Pretty good so far. Very well. Um, he's been able to cut the amount of spending in snow and ice to 21% of this point in time last year through creative weather management. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I we mentioned, we went gone. to 100% salt. Um, this year we spent $136,000 thus far. That seems like a lot with as few storms as we've had, but, but of that, 81,000 was bringing in a nice, big, healthy salt supply so that we would be ready in uh, in any uh, situation. Uh, that salt will be good next year if it's in our salt farm. Great. Um, if the weather continues well, Al, I want to talk about the salt shed. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so obviously, it, you know, we're well below expenditure. Al put in a capital request for his salt shed, which is recommended under my capital plan. However, if the snow and ice budget continues to have a good balance before, um, you know, by April 30th, then whatever surplus he has, if it's 85,000, can go to do that salt shed. Um, so that this good weather is actually going to be a huge benefit if we're able to get that capital expense out of a snow and ice budget, which up until a few years ago you were transferring free cash to cover. So it's a testament to better management, Mother Nature, and also, you know, we continue to make efficiencies to sort of streamline costs. Rick, where located? In the yard. Okay. We're, we're looking for a spot. I'll remind you, it's still only January. Probably um, not Egypt Beach parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't meaning it for that. I was like, is it going to, you know. But whatever, even if he has a little balance, then yeah. um, I'm just I saying, let's not spend shed, it. Yeah. That salt shed is pay as you go free cash in the capital plan. So even if it's 40000 that's all that reduces that 85 in free cash for capital, go to yet another item on the ranked list. Right. And the number that we budgeted was 490000 Compared to 486 or 490 last year, I remember years when it's been. Well, the year before twice it was like 690 or something. Yeah, I mean, it's sad. Right. So it's, you know, it's only January. We're lucky this winter. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, I don't think we have any choice. We're gonna you have to build a salt shed. The state does it, so I think the towns have to. You have no choice. Um, 
can we just take some plans from what one of the state bonds? We don't have to engineer it and all that no, stuff. No, we'll, we probably would concrete use a foundation tent type arrangement anyway. Right. We were looking at the tents, the, the prefab tents that you can purchase and maybe build it up on some concrete, concrete walls right. and put it on top there, even blocks. Right. It, it's Good. not the fancy salt sheds that the state has, but it, it would probably do. It worked. Get it out of the weather, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. We Spaces probably spend a lot more for for a state bond type setup. Yeah, right. Anything else? Okay. Move on to uh, street lights. Yep. Did you shut off some lights? Last year it was 209. This year it's 180. Power prices have come down a little bit, so that's why we feel like we can cover it with 180. It's, it's a little risky, but. Now, that windmill that's going up over there, that will impact this, obviously. Yes depending on how you allocate it. Yeah. So in other words, that, that's not going directly into this budget. That's going into a revolving fund. That we allocate. Yep. And then the, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, street lights are a percentage of our total power, and therefore probably should benefit to that extent. Be a decision for next year. Great. Any questions? Just one question. Are we, are we switching to different types of uh, light sources? We're, we have a goal to do uh, an analysis on that. So okay. um, we don't own the lights. Yes. Um, uh, we probably would like to switch to a different light source than North Citro because those lights are going out all the time. We're up there with our bucket truck changing light bulbs. So <laughs> not sure what's going on there. Um, but National Grid owns those lights, and so it, it's, that's part of it. Mostly what we want to do is in our street light audit is look at there's, there's a uh, there's an engineering purpose for having a street light in, in in any location, and that would be at intersections, at the rise and fall of a hill, or at a, a turn. Something that's unexpected for a driver. Uh, street lights don't create illumination; they create uh, a sense of if you see a shadow moving, such as a pedestrian on the, on the street. So, one thing we're going to go through is look at where all our street lights are relative to those intersections. In many cases, we have way too many street lights, and then they're not in the right places. So uh, we'll work with a, uh, we're going to do an analysis of that and come up with probably uh, changing locations of street lights. And at that point in time would be the time we'd look at different sources, if the price is right. One last street light question. If there's a street light that goes off and on intermittently, is that broken or is that uh, some sort of timing? It's broken. And. Anybody who sees that should go to, uh, the, on the town website is a flashing light where you can then report that to National Grid. Oh, yeah. and they come fix the bulb? They will come right out. Actually, they'll send you an email back saying we got it and we'll go out and do it, yeah. You see the poll number off the poll to say which, which number it is. Yeah, so you go up to the poll, you find the poll number. If there's no poll number, you say at the corner of this and that or in front of house number, number 133 at such, such a road. As much information as you can give them, they, they, they're pretty responsive in that okay. regard. Great. Now we'll go on to the uh, water enterprise fund. Jim, Jim how are you? Yes, I'd just like to start off by uh, thanking the staff at the town hall, Al, and the team that I work with, and uh, the fire department uh, for all the good work they've been doing with us along the way on maintaining and adjusting all the hydrants and um, making sure they're all working properly and they're on and what locations of where they're supposed to be and whatnot. So that's been working out really well for us. So I want to thank the fire department for that. Um, and overall, I just want to, um, we've had uh, reduced customer complaints from last year. We went from 5,600 complaints uh, to about 1,600 complaints this year. And uh, we've been getting better feedback on water quality from our customers. Uh, so we've been seeing a great improvement on water quality with the water restrictions and uh, the Im implementation of our uh, undirectional flushing. So everything's been really working out really well for us at the water department. We're really happy with the goals and accomplishments. Great. Um, just looking at the budget, so we're, we're projecting a, s a small deficit is that right? Thirty-three thousand. Yep. Thirty-three four eight four. 
and is 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 2012 right? Well, the year is that year to date? So no. the year to date? No, that is correct. So there'll be a seven hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar deficit. I see four fifty of it is capital. I don't have this sheet of paper, so I don't know what's on here. Yeah. yeah. On the enterprise fund. Um, want this one out? Oh, who can that be? That's what they got. Huh? Now, if it was a capital article, why would it be? Wouldn't it be funded up top too? shows is for FY12 objective deficit of 724,988 against the revenue. Um, but um, you have unappropriated retained earnings. So even with that, um, you're still going to have a healthy retained earning balance. The difference with this budget is there's no capital in it for FY13. There's only um, $65,000 in it. But the retained earnings, that 695 is after the 33? This, this is the FY12 number that you're looking at is already funded in your FY12 budget. You okay. covered that when you funded the FY12 okay. budget. FY13, it's right. That's the projected 33,894. And that's 695, 695 retained earnings after we right. take care of the 33. The 695 minus the 33,484. Right. And then we minus capital on top of that, which we don't have, which is another 65,000. Right. And then you still have retained earnings of 597. Right. So the 450 in capital articles weren't, were funded through retained earnings, not through free cash. Right. They're coming right out of retained earnings. We don't have to fund them through debt service. And that was the big hit last year, as Mark just mentioned, when we floated the bond. So I know we voted for the last five years to have that 5% increase. Is that in? Yes, this budget contemplates that. This has that in it as yes. well. And it doesn't show it in the uh, doesn't show in the revenue. It shows flat revenues. Yes, but when I recommended the capital plan to pull it out of retained earnings to fund instead of bonding it, uh, that's what I did that. So. So revenue also go up and capital will go down. Capital so your, your revenue, maybe, did you project less use of water? It, well, if you look at the revenue, FY 11, 12, 13, yeah. they're just exactly the same. Right. There's no real thought as to right. what's happening there. So I, I, I think we just it's a rollover of the same number, one, two, three. So uh, it's hard to say. Yeah. Right. Well, I would expect that the Revenue will go down with the harsh restrictions that we put on our waters, our lawn yeah. waters issue. Yeah, you're right. The, the modest restrictions result in that. But what we did do, what we did avoid is the uh, restrictions that would have reduced revenues further, which were would be a complete ban on outside watering. So there's a balance there. So that'll be interesting to look at at some yeah, point. Because the previous year we had those much harsher restrictions of the complete ban on outside watering. For that short period of time. No, no, actually, that went on from August through to uh, December. We had that. Which, uh, ban, we had a ban, a complete water ban. Straight ban. Through yeah. December? Yeah. Through yeah. the winter? Yeah. yeah, because we had to rebuild the system. You got to build it back up. Honestly. But so the, the, those two years of water bans, those outside water bans, lasted. One lasted until, what, November? It was in September, yeah. And one lasted October. Yeah, but people only water till September. Well, for the most part, right? I mean... So the Water Resources well, Commission is working with Al and Jamie on this, and they're yeah. going to be coming in and giving us a report in February. Starting date on this, yeah. yeah. Tons. So. And undoubtedly, you know, if you don't, if you don't use fresh drinking water for uh, keeping grass green, you're not selling that much drinking water. Okay, you're not producing that drinking water either. So we've got to look at that. There, there's two sides of that equation. So you expect the expenses to come down a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, what is it? Yeah. Part of the thing is that for the past four or five years, there's been a major initiative, and this is the same thing that I can say for sewer, so I'll do them both now. You spent a 
you've authorized a lot of capital work for water main and sewer main replacement. And what has happened is then we floated the bond and the debt service on those enterprise funds went way up. So the 5% water rate increase is just going to the debt service. So for the FY13 recommended capital plan, there's virtually no infrastructure recommendation improvements for water or sewer, except for engineering and sewer. But there's a number of other initiatives in water particularly, like scheduled regular maintenance and replacement now of fire hydrants, um, the water meter conversion program. Those programs in and of themselves are forty, fifty thousand dollars a year now, and we have to be committed to those because we're converting all the town to the read only water meters. And our fire hydrants, I mean, the board knows that some of them, I mean, we learned in the December 10th storm a year ago that that fire hydrant was 90 years old that went to that fire on 7th Ave. So there's lots of capital in the budget, but it's short term capital and not major water infrastructure improvement because, to your point, the retained earnings can't really handle that right now um, because of the debt service um, after I recommended bringing them down to pay for those capital items. And again, you have 500,000 threshold. The other thing with SOAR in particular is the betterments are coming in. So some people will pay the full $20,000 betterment and some people will pay it one twentieth. So we need to set aside, even though there's lots of revenue there it looks like, we need to pull aside and set aside that revenue because we're getting that whole betterment in some cases up front, but it needs to fund that budget for the long term in terms of floating the debt for it. The so sewer there's a lot of sewer. There's, yep, in sewer. So there's lots of things going on in water and sewer when we look at the capital, which is really capital infrastructure outside for salaries, that programs we've committed to other than just simple replacement of the water pipes. So all these other initiatives that they're doing is really helping the bottom line too, but we also need to be really conservative on what's the next major initiative. And that's clear because you, if you look at the last one, two, three, four years, the debt was at one hundred eighty to one hundred ninety thousand dollars, and now it's jumped up to almost six hundred thousand right. dollars. So we've right. put a lot, a lot of money into the infrastructure. Right, Sean. And, and well, what we're going to do is we, we, we have to. You know, water study committee is taking on a new uh, thrust, which we're going to come back to probably in August with, and that is a couple things are happening. One is uh, the new permit. Our permit expires on August, in August. Mm -hmm. uh, the state has already sent very clear signals that they are going to. Strong expectations about reduced water consumption per capita uh, and for a period of time. And they have, they have been very explicit about summertime water infrastructure because we find onerous, even we find onerous, more restrictive than what we've got. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so uh, that's one aspect of it. Uh, so revenues are going to be uh, based more on rate charged. Secondly, uh, throughout the U.S., uh, there's this great recognition that there's this, a, a silent problem, which is the buried infrastructure of the water systems, sewer systems in the United States have been undercapitalized, you know, underfunded for capital replacement. And ours is 101, six years old. We're finding that we're replacing sections of it as we go. There's probably a more aggressive capital program needed for water systems throughout the U.S. and in particular, which which may affect that rate. So we're trying to do a very credible study to come back with here's what the capital program needs to look like over the long haul. We aren't going to be able to fund it at the rate we're going. We're very happy with our low water rates, but we may be killing ourselves in the long run because we don't have enough capital to keep our system together. That's it. One second. Along those lines, have we really done any upgrades to the plant itself I remember Jimmy took me through there a while ago and I don't know you know and we've done I've seen a lot obviously we've all seen a lot along the roads but you know a, a old time plumber told me a while ago don't forget about the plant you know and I, I don't know is that in some along the lines you just mentioned that we're gonna have to really come up to speed at some point you know, we don't have generators at our wells so when we have that power That's just a simple thing of yep. not capital investors. 
effectively. Our, our, the factories that I ran, that, uh, that I helped build in 1972, had, had better controls, had, had a higher degree of sophisticated controls in 72 than what we have in a water scale. Yeah. Guys get in trucks and drive over to the tanks and see how high the water is. And basically, in this business, usually up to 15 to 20 years, you're right. Uh, Equipment's pretty much getting to be obsolete. Instrumentation. And the biggest thing I can remember that we may have done to the plant was we replaced the GAC bed about three or four years ago, right? Half, half, half of it. Half. Yeah. Half of When's it. the other half up? We'd like to. <laughs> yeah, I like to do it now. Yeah. Did we get some generators? So if we have another major issue, that we don't have that problem again? Yeah, we have uh, a couple things going on. One is we we were able to get a generate one generator. We have one in the capital program that. We've already spec'd out, and we're going to be installing as soon as the capital budget's approved at our, at our dominant well site. And uh, that's our biggest we're well. And our resurplus. We were denied the two army surplus this last Oh, really? We were not going to install a well site. So. Trade him a truck. <laughs> Give him a boat. Oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We'll still find. We'll still keep applying. Give us some army surplus generators in Pennsylvania. Not that, not that it's neither here nor there, but something else said about in the national trend with all this, just so people understand we're not alone. But the biggest housing boom in U.S. history was obviously post-World War II, baby boom in the 1950s, early 60s. And so that's when all across the country, all the water infrastructure mostly was put in. And guess what? That was 50 years ago. So it's all coming to pass right now. 66 years ago. Yeah. Plus or minus. Great. Any other questions on the water? Great. Thank you. And why don't we jump to the sewer? I know you touched on some of the stuff, betterments and um, that sort of stuff. Bob Roland. <coughs> Bob, how are you? Good. Uh, Good. I think Al touched on uh, most of the major uh, problems. <laughs> um, great. The financial picture shows. Um, a $462,000 deficit. After that, there's still almost a million and a half of retained earnings. Revenue is flat. Expenditures are actually um, down a little bit. The um, You know, it matches last year. Last year we had a three and fifty-one thousand dollar deficit. So the big numbers are. Oh, look at that! We did that paid in advance in 2011. Did we just take it all in that one year? Is that a betterment? Yeah, it was a paid in advance betterment. Yeah, so you didn't. Now you backed it out. Yes, yeah. Right. This and this is new because I told Mary this year I want her to start setting aside, netting out the betterment. Not all of it, but a certain proportion. So there's actually credit. nothing in here. Um, so this is why you see no capital, just really nominal. It's for the I and I. That's it for our budget. Too. And the indirect cost. Uh, that's right. But that's okay because we're finishing out the squash kit. So we have, we're in a position to take a breather to determine which next phase of the sewer is before we go into design and engineering. So, But the debt's not going to go down. So the retained earnings over the next three years is going to be hit pretty hard. We still have the benefits coming in, though. The squash kit one will hit sometime in FY13. So are the back end. So remember, those are still coming in over the term as well. But the debt's not in there yet, is it? The debt, let's see. No, the debt is not. Let me see. The FY, you have the debt service at 1.1. 1 .1. Right. So that'll go up. Well, we'll just have to look at the sewer rates and see if they have to be, you know, adjusted. They may re I mean, we had this conversation last year. We raised them last year for the first time in a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
some of this is, you know, I think we'll have to look at it and maybe, you know, I don't know if you want to raise them now or not. Well, I think this year we're fine because yeah. there's a lot of retained earnings, but we'll have to forecast out the next three or four years and see where that's. I think we should have a general program of increasing the, these rates. I think there's. <coughs> I mean, we hate to increase rates, but you know, we got to look at the financial picture and see what yeah. what the out years are going to be. Yeah, it also kind of fits into the regulatory um, outlook as well, and in some of the engineering things we're talking about. Because if we're able to, one of the good things about I and I is it dilutes the inflow, so you know our, our nitrogen incoming is of a lower concentration. Obviously, but we do want to get rid of I and I. So doesn't if we change the total nitrogen, doesn't change the total nitrogen, but right. So, but we could accomplish that with a water hose or the uh, effluent. Correct. Right. But there are a lot of other things that we can do to increase capacity, which is also increasing revenue. And you know, it's been a long time. I guess what I'm trying to get at. I'm sorry, it's getting late. I'm a little tired, but. We talked, I think you and I did, or maybe you and I did, about having a study, having an engineering firm come in and look at the sewage treatment plant operation in terms of what we can do to address the nitrogen loading and see if we can raise our capacity in one of those, in one of those ways. And raising capacity is also sort of raising revenue and serving more people. It's been a long time since we've actually looked at this. And particularly in the last five years, there have been some major changes in how some of these things can be addressed that would help, you know, help help the system. And um, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how to go about it, but I think I think you guys should start thinking about that. Yeah. That's what has been our focus the last five years. Yeah. Yeah. Processing cost, chemicals and, and well, I'm not saying you guys are doing anything wrong. You're doing no, great. No, You're doing great. I'm just thinking, like, let's let's try to get because it looks like you're getting your hands around I and I. Right. But you know, on the other side of it, here's one thing: there is some pump, and there are some pumps out there connected improperly. And every sump pump that's connected is a house that is not able to be connected. Yeah. Okay. And that sump pump is uh, not being built uh, right. for the flow. This generated. So right. we are um, we are looking at some very specific ways to get at the non-revenue producing sump pump, whether it's getting obtaining revenue as a result of the sump pump being there, uh, or through a revenue approach getting sump pumps out of the system. Uh, we've tried uh, Bob and his crowd long before I got here, and Anthony as well worked on I&I &I and identifying leaks and fixing leaks. and trying to uh, audit homes that were in areas where sump pumps are very likely, where neighbors do have sump pumps, where we don't see any visible sign of a sump pump being connected externally. There's a lot of suspicion. And we have a list of 151 homes that, quite frankly, look, after four years, five years of working with it, we're pretty convinced we probably have sump pumps going. That's, that's a whole, I mean, we're adding 303 homes in Musquashka. That's a whole district of homes that we're not able to hook up because we're sump pumps. not collecting money for sump pumps or we're having sump pumps connected to our system. Yeah. Can I jump so that's where we're looking for in. capacity. That's one of the, the um, thrusts of the department is to grow capacity for eventual connections. Yeah, and, and then, then we're have I just think it's important to say, because I've contacted DPW years ago when I was doing a job, and with your permission and, and so forth, the, the right permit, you can take that sump pump and, and pipe it into a catch basin. Am I correct? Is that yes, still the way? Right, right. And I just think it's... A program to help you do that. Right. And I'm, all right. Just, I think it's important you mention that because people may not realize it. And you had a very successful amnesty program several years ago as well that, that, that helped. And there will be people Everybody else. 
what's the same for you. Yeah. Uh, just a comment before we get too far removed from from uh, the discussion on raising fees and, and, and these different things. I, I, I just could, wouldn't let it, couldn't let it go by. <coughs> I think that I'm going to be looking in the future, and this is through no fault of anybody's, a lot of the fees. People in this town are being strangled between taxes that have gone out of sight for many people. I mean, became a, a home-threatening expense now. And to just automatically think that we're going to raise fees when we come in, not that you're doing this, but I'm just making a statement, that we are automatically going to raise fees to solve a funding problem may not be the way to go in the future. We may have to look at alternative ways of cutting those budgets, uh, doing something else, and that's not my area of expertise, it's yours and the town administrators. But I think this idea of raising fees has to be looked at long and hard in the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move on to the transfer station. Um, just, uh, I guess we can jump right to the numbers. Uh, transfer station is uh, budgeting a surplus of twenty-one, twenty-two thousand dollars. Has a retained earning of two hundred eighty thousand dollars. Revenues flat. Expenses are relatively flat. Um, you do have the $100,000 um, allocation from the uh, landfill, the old landfill capping, which is helpful. But um, but it looks uh, looks pretty pretty straightforward. You're running the operation at at the uh, to live within its means is what we've always asked to do. Um, I don't know. Do you have any? Um, an error on this budget and not so much an error but a correction that needs to be made um, the repair and maintenance line item 543520 needs to be increased how much Al? Yeah. how much? 10. 10 so from 28 to 38 yeah. Yeah. you're doing a terrible job I can't believe it. Uh, those are blue bags <laughs> It's like uh, the blue bags, you know, if, you don't, if we don't buy the blue bags, you can't sell them. <laughs> so uh, that, that's what that is. I thought that was, we needed the repair budget for the No, that's the vehicle services. Oh. vehicle services. That's vehicle services, right, yeah. Right, sorry. That's the blue bags services. is still yeah. blue bags is the same. Al requested two backhoes in the trans uh, capital plan. And I told him he could only get one, one in water and one in transfer. So. Because I did not approve the transfer, recommend the transfer station one, I couldn't similarly reduce the repair and maintenance based on prior expenditure because indeed it will probably, we'll need to get another year. So the $20,000, well, that's in the capital plan, it's amortized, right? No, yeah. this is, has to go into his operating budget for repair and maintenance. No, no, the, the actual truck. He's in water, he's not getting it. We're not getting it, but. But the JCB that we have at the transfer station is a 1986 with a zillion miles on it, hours on it, and everything else. So it's, it's equivalent to the K car if somebody's still driving around the K car. Okay. So instead of a $21,000 surplus, there's an $11,000 surplus. But again, um, and this is to commend um, the DPW administration, if you look at the, what the deficit was in that account uh, three years ago, yeah. um, it was. Hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars in FYO eight, sixty-six thousand, a little less in FYO nine, and then with the changes the board and and the DPW made, we actually had a surplus of one hundred and twenty-one, and actually have some retained earnings, which we didn't have any of. Right. So it's really moving in the right direction. It's being really well managed. And the revenue numbers, frankly, are lower than what they were in fiscal year two thousand eleven. So more than likely, they're going to be. A little higher. Well, the more people recycle, the less we get in revenue, and that's so it's, it's also a mixed less. Our re as much well, don't we get money? Some money for? Well, it's we don't one get much money, but it lowers our it lowers another line. The, the hauling. Right. And you have that down thirty something grand. But if you're recycling more, you're buying less bags and the whole disposal. Are any of those recycling contracts coming up soon? That 
might be we favorable just, for us. We just renegotiated it uh, about two months ago. Uh, we oh, yeah. around the board for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we did get more favorable rates. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I think it's about 400000 over the term. Yeah, that's great. Kevin's on a consortium, a South Shore consortium that we are members of that uh, are looking for new ways of recycling uh, clothing, that sort of thing. Anything we get out of the stream mass stream is to our advantage. We also renegotiated uh, uh, with CMAS and then a more favorable project uh, contract. Well, you remember that because it's a long term contract. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Great. Good Guys, job. hold on one from the audience. Yes, Dan Vermont. Um, it's my understanding that the transfer station stickers come due at the end of March, they expire. And are the fees for the transfer station stickers? Yes. 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 There's no plan to increase fees, and but it goes from March to March, so it's yeah, a full 12 months. But we will. Uh, we yeah. we are intending to honor those stickers through July 1st. Yeah. So if if the ticket if the sticker that you bought last year was your last one, then you're going to be able to use it for the full 12 months through June 30th. They're not going to. But the ticket that you're going to be buying on March 31st is going to be good for a few full 12 months through March, March 31st, 31st, 2013. I, I really think that that needs to get out into the public sector. Yeah. Now we'll, later. What we'll do is uh, we'll post that at the transfer station, um, and then 100% of the residents will. will I think people that. will appreciate more when we do announce this that they won't have to fill out paper forms anymore and that is why it has not been announced yet because the entire system for both beach stickers and transfer station stickers is going electronic electronic only we converted the entire database and once that's complete we have a meeting about it in the next week or so then we will advise <coughs> how they can apply that. and that'll be electronic only we're trying to make it as paperless as possible so folks don't have the long lines and have to fill out the same piece of paper every year. Their, sis, their data will all be in the computer and That's it correct. will be a lookup instead of the long lines and the paper. And that is why nothing has been out yet. So we'll get that out. But you do bring up a valid point. That was a, a point of, of concern. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And good job, gentlemen. Yes. Very good. Mike, what's the record? Keep up the good work. Great job. We gotta we gotta get a rink in situ. Uh, that would be <laughs> awesome. Actually, be that was that was a discussion we had last week about a possibility of an outdoor rink. Yeah. Like on the common, is that something? Yeah, is that something sorry. that we? It looks nice. Is sorry. that something that we could think nice about pool. doing? You know, nice at pool. least on the common, Mike. Is that something? <laughs> you some ducks swimming in there. Okay, now we're going to go through some of the uh, articles. This way. The first article is the uh, compensation of elected officials. Yes. Sure, we can postpone hers. Why don't we do the other ones? Well, there's other elected officials that. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. There's no change from FY. So we'll hold out the. Is that the same article, though? It is. It's all grouped up in the same article, so if you were to vote to support it, it seems like it would be better to wait until we take it in its entirety. Well, we can discuss it and vote it. It's the board's pleasure. Yeah. Um, there was no change in the budget submitted by the town clerk relative to this issue, so I don't know what, what the like? nature of her question is. So in terms of the other elected officials, it's the selectmen. There's no change to that. Correct. Right? That's the same. Assessors. The assessors. That's the same also. Right. So the only one we need to discuss further would be the um, clerk. And at this point, are, are you intending on getting together with her and go over it? Or? Well, she, again, it, 
Kim told me yesterday, so that's why I was amenable to postponing it. She was away on vacation, but um, I will definitely yeah. speak with her. Uh, yeah. But there's no change in, in the clerks either? Well, she's going to propose something probably. She, she would like to be present to be able to speak to the article and to her salary. Okay. And, and just for the... No, no, that's fine. That. Just for the board's information, the salary line item for the budget submitted was not changed by me. It was what was submitted oh. by the town clerk. Okay. And was that flat with last year? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, so we'll discuss her item tomorrow and then vote the whole, or not, next, next meeting, and we'll vote the whole thing then. Sure. Um, revolving funds, did you say the same thing for that? The revolving fund, um, it, we have several revolving funds now that involve the solar array and the wind turbine, Tony, and I need to get with Al to um, project that revenue for all of FY13. So when Kim asked me, I forgot that those right, We'll just wait on that one, too. So um, that, that was my bad. All right, so let's go to um, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 91. This is an article that's been on there for 375 years. Give or take. Give or take a couple. It's standard language. We have to do it if we want to get any funding from the um, federal government or state government for any of our water work. Waterways work. Yeah. And it just takes, says that we take on the liability. So move the article regarding Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 91 liability. Second. Second by Mr. Norton. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. And then the Golf Course Enterprise Fund. We went over this a couple of meetings ago. Um, so this is uh, to vote the expenditure for that department. Um, it came in at, was it a slight deficit? What was the? Uh, well, the budget that I recommended had a $76,000 projected deficit. The board voted to increase the rates. The mm -hmm. revenue was reprojected, and given that, there's actually a projected surplus of about $2,300. Right. So a $2,300 surplus at this expenditure based on the rates that we increased. Motion. Move the golf course enterprise fund article as written. Second. Second by Mr. Norton. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. And. Uh, move on to item number seven, which is discussion. Vote for a drain layers license renewal. If they're all new renewals, can we just read them off? Sure. Unless anybody has any, does anyone want to single anyone out to talk about? No. Nope. Nope. Then yes. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to grant the following drain layers license renewals for the year 2012. Jeffrey K. Morse. Iaria Brothers Inc., P.F. Spencer Jr. Inc., Larry Lundine, Hanson Fuel, <coughs> McEachern Contracting, Spirito Environmental Services, Rosano Davis Sanitary Pumping Inc., Russell B. Topman Jr., Joseph Bonomi Contracting, McDougal Brothers Enterprises, LLC. Second. Second by Mr. Danny. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Um, item number eight is to uh, vote a temporary appointment. Um, this is for the um, accountant in light of the fact that our town uh, accountant recently took a new position. We need to uh, appoint Todd Hassett as uh, the temporary position of town accountant. Yeah. Anything to add on that, Trish? No. Okay. Motion. Before we, can I just say yeah. something? Well, I'd wait until really Trisha well. sits down. What's that, Sean? Just going to gonna wait for Trisha to go back to her seat. I to take just a comment. Sorry, Sean. No, that's all right. I just, before we make this motion on agenda item number eight, I, I just wanted to thank you. I was sitting here listening, and I whispered to Joe, you were doing Mary's job as well as your own. And I just, you know, you, thank you. You did a good job. Thank you. you know? I mean, Mary's staff's terrific, and we're being helped out. I And Mary's gone. And we wish her well, but um, when we did the interim services, I expected we need someone up to two days to do the warrants and the payroll vouchers and whatever. And uh, he came in for his first day last Wednesday, and he said he only needs to be here once a week because the office is in such good shape. 
Thank you, Chris. And at the MMI, I know as a Joe, we saw Mary um, a number of times, as well as the uh, auditing firm and the woman. I can't remember the woman's name that uh, that was heading up here, but she said it went splendidly, and um, we're supposed to get reports in the next month or so. Or? Yeah, and I hope to have a recommendation for you for an appointment at your next meeting. So. Great. Um, did we vote that? No. no. No, I interrupted you. Sorry. Um, second. Board of Selectmen votes to temporarily appoint Todd Hassett to the position of town accountant. Second. So, second by Mr. Murray. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Um, move on to item number nine, which is other business. Any other business? Rick? Mm -hmm. Quick one. <coughs> when was the last time we spoke to Verizon about maybe coming on in for Fios? I know it's we, we raise it with them every year, every two years Balls. or something. A year ago, I think. Things keep changing technology-wise, and other towns around seem to be getting it. And little old situates still being left out. I know when we redid the Comcast contract, we certainly allowed for competition. Um, maybe it might be worth asking them again. I don't know when the last time we asked was. Um, not directly, but I met with the interim school superintendent, uh, Dr. Kelleher, last week. And as you know, they're doing the technology plan for the school and actually invited Verizon to come in to see if they were interested in providing that service and he provided some interesting information to share with you. Oh, will be good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. That's it for me. No. Nope. No, Mr. Chair. Nope. Just one quick thing, uh, Rick, last night that um, they're going to be expanding the sailing program this summer with the Mercury's and the 420's um, just because it's a huge, huge uh, demand and the spring programs will be coming out second week in February. Sean, please don't encroach on my sports report. I'm trying, just, Tony. I got a long way to go. Stay away from <laughs> The hockey update was given by the coach, Mike Breen. They're having a great year. Eight and two, I think he said. The girls basketball team continues to do stellarly. They're ranked like number five on the South Shore and the boys team is doing great too. They won a very close game the other day against Whitman. So Friday nights, they're usually at the high school. Great entertainment. Um, only other note on school, uh, the, the principal, uh, Donna Nuzzo, um, gave her resignation, I think, about a week ago. So um, sorry to see her go. She's done a great job there. And if you go to that basketball game, you'll see her there. Um, and that's all I have. So we'll move on to item number 10, which is the minutes. Yeah, I'd like to move that the Board of Selectmen vote to accept the regular session minutes of January 17th, 2012. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in, all in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. Aye that's 4-0. I'd also like to move um, providing um, that um, the minutes from the executive session of January 17th, 2012, uh, I would move to have them accepted, providing the last sentence be deleted. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 And that's 4-0 again. Um, item number 11, motion to adjourn. Move, Move to adjourn, 915. Second. 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 Second by Mr. Norton. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thanks, Zach. Zach Good night, thank folks. You. And thanks for coming.